And the answer lies in how we talk about the world. The world can be described as particles obeying the laws of physics, but it is not the only way to talk about the world. When you meet someone for the first time, when you go on a first date, and your, your date says, tell me about yourself, you do not list the positions and velocity, velocities of all the electrons, protons, and neutrons in your body. I'm from Caltech. At Caltech, that would be considered pretty hot, actually. But uh, <laughs> it's not plausible. It's not really feasible. It's not a useful way of thinking about the world. Now, so what you would do is you would describe yourself in more coarse-grained terms. You would use another kind of vocabulary. You would probably not use the word atom at all for you non-Caltechers out there. When you described about who you were, what you cared about, what it was that made you you, you would tell some story about who you were. All of the freedom to bring meaning and purpose and right and wrong into the world and here's in that ability to tell different stories about the world. So the poet, Muriel Rukeyser, put it as succinctly as you can. The universe is made of stories, not of atoms. Now you might say, I just told you the world is made of atoms. This is also true. The universe is also made of atoms, not of stories. It depends on how you're describing the universe. What Rukeyser is pointing to is the fact that we bring reality to life we give it shape by talking about it in different ways. That might sound pretty thin, just talking about a universe that exists. But the freedom to do that in different ways really makes the universe what it is for us. We access and confront the world by telling stories about it. And when I say story, I don't mean to, mean to say a fictional story. I'm talking about a true story. If you want to gussy it up, call it a theory or a model or an ontology or a vocabulary, depending on which department you're talking in front of. But these ways of talking about the world are what we need to figure out to make meaningfulness exist in a world governed by particle physics. So let me give you the simplest possible example of multiple overlapping stories you can tell about the world. Before we talk about meaning and purpose, let's talk about fluid mechanics and thermodynamics, because I know that's what you've been itching to hear about. <laughs> so if you have a box of gas, you are allowed to talk about it by listing the positions and the velocities of every particle of gas in that box. That's a complete description. You don't need more information to say what's going to happen. But you could also talk about it by just giving the temperature of the gas, the pressure of the gas, the, the velocity, and so forth, the density as a function of where you are in space. That is another way to talk about it. It is not as comprehensive. Its range of validity is not as broad as the language of atoms and molecules. But it's much more useful if you want to know, is it hot in the room or not? And these concepts we introduce, like temperature and pressure, are not non-existent. They are real. They are emergent at this higher level of description. But the temperature in the room is just as real as the atoms that make it up. In this higher level vocabulary there, vocabulary, there can even be concepts that are crucially important and real, even though they completely don't exist in the lower level vocabulary. So here's an example, irreversibility, my favorite feature of the macroscopic world. Certain things happen in one direction of time, but never the opposite direction. Bring a hot thing and a cold thing together into contact, they will both become warmer. Bring two warm things into contact, they will never separate and become hot and cold. That is a true feature of thermodynamics, known as the second law of thermodynamics. And it has absolutely no analog in the laws of molecules and atoms. The laws of atoms are completely reversible. There is no arrow of time at the level of atoms. That does not mean that the arrow of time that we observe in our world is not real. It's just part of a different way of describing the same situation. So that's the context we need to bring to mind when we start talking about values, about what it means to lead a meaningful life, to have purpose in our existence. It is not given to us by the laws of nature. Quantum field theory does not tell you right from wrong, does not tell you how to lead a meaningful life. It is your choice how to judge things as right or wrong, the story that you choose to tell. What are you going to label as right? What are you going to label as wrong? What are you going to count as having a fulfilling, purposeful existence? 
It is not fixed by the facts of physics. It is in the story that you choose to tell about the physical world. So how do you choose one story over the other? The answer is, well, again, I'm not telling you the answer. I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm telling you what we need to take into account when we talk about doing it. And that is, we are not blank slates. Human beings do not just pop into existence in the world free of any judgments ourselves. We have goals. We have aspirations. We have feelings. We have desires. We have judgments. And the point is, how can we tell a consistent story, a reflective equilibrium, that takes our judgments into consideration with those of other people and the laws of nature of the universe in which we live. We need to tell a story that makes sense to us, that fits in with the natural aspirations we have and the laws of physics that lets us go to the places we want to go. So I have time for precisely one example. And again, I'm not, being, uh, I'm not telling you what is right from wrong. I'm telling you how to think about right and wrong. So here would be two fundamentally different ways of thinking about the problem of should we let same-sex couples get married? A very down-to-earth, real, political question. One point of view would be to say that there is a natural way for human beings to live. There is a right and wrong arrangement of our social order. The right arrangement is to have marriage be between a man and a woman, and therefore same-sex couples should not be allowed to marry. And what I would argue is that this is simply a mistake. This is simply wrong. This is based on an incorrect way of thinking about our world. Our world does not have natural ways to be. It does not have right or wrong ways to be. We invent those right or wrong ways. So the second way is that how to live, what is right and what is wrong, is a decision we human beings have to make. No configuration is naturally Correct, it is something that we create inside ourselves. We decide how best to guarantee happiness and protect individual dignity. Now, with that understanding, you could still argue that same-sex couples should not be allowed to marry. You, would say, you could say, I think that given who we are as human beings, we should decide not to let that happen. But I would also argue that once you realize that this notion of rightness or wrongness is not given to you by either God or the universe, that it only comes from within ourselves and our attempts to make a just society that is fair to everyone, chances are that you're going to come down on the side that we should let people who are in love get married to each other. So I wanted to end as I began uh, with pictures of things in the sky. I have two pictures. This is us. This is a famous picture. This is the pale blue dot. This is an image taken by the Voyager satellite 1.4 billion miles away from Earth when Carl Sagan encouraged NASA to turn it around and take a last parting photograph of us here on Earth. There we are. The universe gave us a little blue circle to live inside. That was very sweet. <laughs> and the thing to take home from this picture is that we are very small in the universe. We do not take up a lot of space. And just in case, this is not sufficient at making you humble. Here is the universe. This is uh, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is what you get if you take your camera and you point it at an empty section of the sky and you leave the shutter open for a long time and your camera is attached to the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> you will see that what you thought was an empty section of the sky is in fact alive with all of these galaxies. We live in a galaxy, the Milky Way, roughly order of magnitude about 100 billion stars. Every one of these other galaxies typically has about 100 billion stars in it. There are about 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. Uh, so we are very, very tiny indeed. There's probably all sorts of interesting things going on in these other galaxies. Probably there's no Las Vegas anywhere else in the observable <laughs> universe. But the point is really, even though we are small, that's not the point I actually want to make. My point is that despite the fact that we are small, in both space and in time, we've been doing science seriously for a few hundred years, the universe is 13.7 billion years old, we've figured this out. We know what is going on out there. We know why this light is shining. We know what those galaxies are. There's a lot we don't know, and we're working on that, full employment for people like me. <laughs> but we've taken the first steps toward a true, deep, 
rich, fulfilling understanding of the universe, which is knowing the rules of the game. It's now up to us to become good at playing the game, to be good human beings in ways that does not impose on the universe an image we would like it to have, but rather accepts the universe for what it is and creates meaning within that universe. Thank you.